Then good morning, Your Grace. Good morning. Thank you for agreeing to this interview. It's a great privilege for us to be here today. Um, your flock is eagerly looking forward to your Episcopal ordination and they're dying to know more about you. So without further ado, perhaps we can ask you a few questions. Sure. Okay, so first question is, could you share with us about yourself, your family and your hometown? Okay, uh, I come from Suramban, a small town in Negri Sambilan. Uh, probably know the place. Yes. And uh, I come from a family of four. I've got an elder sister, a younger sister and a younger brother. So four siblings. Uh, my parents were teachers. They are retired, retired now. Uh, both my sisters are married and my, with two children each. Uh, my younger brother is in Singapore, uh, still single, and uh, yeah, we come from uh, quite a close-knit family, but today only my parents live in Suramban, the rest are in KL, and yeah, now I've just moved down to KL myself from Penang. How did you first become attracted to the priesthood? Well, uh, must have gone back in the primary primary school days, I guess, uh, as an altar boy, working or rather serving in church and being so close to the sanctuary and with priests, uh, with sisters that have kept me close to the church. Um, probably, Father, a few priests come to mind, uh, if I remember correctly, Father Peter from France, Father Peter Bratelo. Yes. He has gone back to France now. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember as an altar boy, he used to celebrate Mass in Tamil. And his mm -hmm. Tamil is perfect, I'm told. Uh, so he was one priest with his, with his lively animation and a and few other priests as I was growing up. Father Naden comes to mind who worked with the Orang Aslis and with the poor and a few others. Uh, Father Lima, the parish priest that I was, that he was in Suramban when I was growing up. Um, these were the few uh, among many who, who made me think a bit more about the priesthood. Uh, different from, or rather apart from the normal careers that people people indulge in uh, or rather go into lawyers, doctors, teachers, engineers. So it's another dimension. What about priests? Why not a priest? So that made me think and uh, to consider that option as, as, as another career or another vocation rather than the norm. What was the first thing that went through your mind when you were invited to become a new Archbishop of Colombo? I thought this cannot be happening. And uh, when I heard it from the nuncio that, that morning in his office, I said, uh, yeah, this is something that will be life-changing. I requested time to, to be in prayer before I gave him an answer. So, so the first thing was disbelief and fear. And yeah, it just can't be happening. Subsequently, there are other other problems, other worries, other concerns, but the first thing was, was this. Has the fear subsided since then? <laughs> it has increased actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as, yeah, as, as, as things unfold, as I become more aware of the enormi enormity of, of this position, uh, fear is always there, but I guess consolation and the grace of God is even greater. And what do you see as the biggest challenges that are facing the church today, and particularly 
uh, here in Malaysia or in Asia? Uh, there are many challenges. Uh, but I think for Malaysia itself, for the church to, I guess we have to take the lead in changing the the agenda that seems to be played out these days, pitting one religion against another, one race against another. And I think the church has to maybe take a step back and maybe break away from this script that seems to be so prevalent these days, especially the last few few years. And to be a catalyst for for change, for reconciliation, but I think more importantly to erase this suspicion between races, between religions that does not augur well for nation building. When you can't trust someone, you, you, you can't dialogue at a, at a deeper level. There's always that apprehension. So I guess it's the first challenge is to, to erase these, these suspicions, these uh, thoughts of wanting to convert each other. and So these suspicions have to be cast aside. And I think we need to show, we need to take the lead to, to let others know, especially those who are suspicious of, of Catholics or Christians in general, that we are friends, we are pilgrims on the same journey and we need one another. Uh, Your Grace, could you explain the motto you have chosen and what it means to you personally? The motto I chose is uh, integrity and tenderness. Um, how it came about? Um, it was actually integrity was there, some uh, a word that Thing speaks for itself. A person without integrity cannot hold his head high and uh, cannot speak with, with authority. So uh, uh, an archbishop or for that matter any person that is worth his salt should be a person of integrity, that his word means something. And I feel that this word integrity should be a reminder to me, so I put it in this motto. And the second word that I was trying to, to also compliment came about when I attended a reunion with, with a group of uh, friends that we had known for 25, 30 years during our uni days. And we had a reunion two days after the announcement was, or rather the appointment was made. Um, and we had a study day on the uh, Evangelii Gaudium of Pope Francis and Friar John Wong, uh, OFM mm -hmm. priest, mentioned that word tenderness in his, in his sharing. And, and it was confirmed two days later at the reading of the Monday's Daily Mass from Hosea. The same word, tenderness, came out and integrity was also in that passage. So I took it as a confirmation that uh, this will be the motto for my episcopate. Uh, integrity and tenderness as a good shepherd, as, as a shepherd of the flock to heal, to, to tend to the wounds of the sheep. I think, and tenderness also, I think it, it goes further than just being soft. It is also being compassionate, being concerned for the weak. So I think this would also be another reminder for my episcopate to be, to be a shepherd more first and foremost before an administrator and to care for the heart of, of all that will be under my, my care. Connected really with what you've been saying, 
the qualities of a bishop in this day and age? What do you think are the most important ones? As I said, uh, to be a shepherd, to be a father to, to his priests, and then to be also a, a pastor to, to the sheep, to the flock. And the image of the good shepherd, it's, it's always carrying the one lost. And uh, in an interview I gave somewhere else, the four L's, the lost, the little, the least, and the last. So I guess to, 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 to look out for all these uh, in, in, in my episcopate, I hope to, to, of course without neglecting the others, uh, but to have a special place for these four L's which will encompass uh, children being, and the youth, the migrants, the, the lost, the lapsed Catholics, those who, who have left the church. I think these would be my, my priority, the four L's. And, uh, as I said, without neglecting the others. Um, so the qualities would be this to, to, to search out, to look, to tend to the, especially the sick, the, 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 the outcasts of society and, and try to bring them back to the fore. Um, and this is something I hope that it will spread, it will catch on among the, the, the archdiocese and also throughout the country. Uh, so this would be a very important quality as, as a bishop and, and also as a, as, as a shepherd to, to defend, to defend the weakest, to defend the flock. So it could be on the level of faith, on the level of doctrine, on the level of different, different uh, attacks even from within the church. So Sacrifice is also another quality a bishop, for that matter, any leader should have. So these are the two main ones I can think of, besides many others. Your Grace, is there a particular saint that you look for, you look to for inspiration and as a model for your ministry? Actually, I don't have any particular one saint that, that I look for or look up to. There are so many saints throughout our history and I think each one has something to contribute. Each saint has its own charism. Uh, today we have St. Augustine, the feast that we have, we've just celebrated. I mean, he's, he's one that we can learn a lot from. Not that he's my model, not the first half of his life anyway. Uh, but a sense of, from Augustine, we learn that we, there's always hope, there's always, uh, there's always the opportunity to, to repent if you don't put it off too late. Uh, that God is always merciful, that He welcomes sinners when we know that we have sinned and we come back. And yesterday, St. Monica, his mother, how prayers, how tears can bring about conversion of in others. So, St. Francis of Assisi, which Pope Francis takes after, we learn simplicity, we learn to look after nature, so every, every saint has something to offer. So for me, I don't have any particular saint. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm not saintly. But, uh, uh, I guess to, to, to emulate, to imitate all these qualities which, which are in Jesus Christ uh, in one way or other. So I guess if we, and every 
they say every sinner has a past, or rather every saint has a past, sorry, and every sinner has a future. So every saint has some stain. So, but Jesus Himself, I guess, will be the model for, for me, the sinless one, to 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 follow after. Yeah. I'm far, far away from 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 this model, but something that I strive each day to be more like Him. Okay. So nowadays, people very often rush to judgment on what they think or categorize people as. For example, Pope Francis, as soon as he appeared on the balcony without the Mazetta and without people were saying, ah, oh, this is a different man, this is a new man, this is something. How would you personally like to be not categorized, but how would you like to be known and loved by your flock? What, what as? I think uh, everyone would like to be popular, to be loved, to be, to be looked up to. And I guess the position of the Archbishop of Kuala Lumpur is not a popularity contest. I guess I need to be true to this position uh, uh, as, as, as a leader, as a pastor, as a shepherd. And these titles or these uh, expectations will also come with it, come with it, uh, making difficult decisions. And it may not be popular. And I guess I need to ensure that uh, whatever decisions I make it is not to please men, but rather is it the right thing to do. Is it the proper thing to do? And in saying so, is it for the benefit of, of, of the people rather than for uh, individuals or for different groups with vested interests? Mm -hmm. So as, a, as I would like to be known as a person okay, of integrity, a person who is able to make tough decisions but with consultation, with proper discernment, and although may not be popular, but it is the right thing to do. And, um, I hope it, it, I would please God rather than to please the masses. Okay. Um, please, you had a successful career before joining the priesthood. Uh, what encouragement can you give to others who are established in the world of work and yet feel the call of Christ deep in their hearts? Okay. I remember uh, a person uh, I, 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 that has helped me in my discernment told me that if God wants you, He will get you sooner or later. Okay. So <laughs> I continued my studies, I, I, I worked, and finally, I'm in the priesthood. So I would tell those who, who are already working, who are already established, if they hear the call of God, do not fear. Um, God will make a way as he has done for me. Uh, be who the person you can be to the fullest at any particular time. If you are a student, be the best student that you can be. And if you are working, do your best, do your, give your best. And, and if halfway through your career you hear God's call, do not be afraid to, to, to give it a try. And that's what I did. I didn't want, again I met a retired policeman, at 55 he was going for vocation camps because he didn't answer the call when he was 25. He, he, he pushed it aside and he, he didn't answer the call at that age and at 55 he was still wondering whether he could have been a priest. So I told myself when I was in the 20s, when I met him, I didn't want to be in his shoes. So I, 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 
I waited till I was 30 before I, I went into the seminary. But uh, you need not wait so long. But at the same time, if you hear the call, speak to a vocation director or a spiritual director and get some, some guidance, uh, go through a discernment process so that as St. Augustine today he says, late have I known you. Don't keep it, don't wait till it's too late when we are in our 50s before we start joining the seminary. When you become a priest, you straight away become the chaplain of the old folks' home. Uh, so if you, to, to respond, and if God wants you, I believe he will, he will make a way for, for those in, 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 in the corporate world, in the working world. And as a church uh, here in Kuala Lumpur, we're a melting pot of cultures and traditions and different people and there are diverse expressions of the faith. How do you view diversity as uh, a potential strength in the context of our vocation as a people of God to evangelization? Maybe an analogy. Uh, nasi lemak or roja, you have a variety of ingredients. The more ingredients you put in, makes it more colorful, it makes it tastier, rather than just bland taste. So I would see, especially in, 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 in this country of ours, Malaysia, and more so these past few years where we have our brothers and sisters from Sabah and Sarawak coming over to the peninsula, students, nurses, people in universities, I think it has enriched the church in Peninsula and in Kuala Lumpur especially. Um, I believe our Archdiocese is, is very fortunate to be able to have not only all these different cultures from our Sabah and Sarawak uh, dioceses that are here, but we also have Catholics from all over the world, all over, uh, even different continents, not only in Asia, but now Africans and, and uh, from the Middle East. Uh, we've got so many different, different uh, cultures and traditions. And therefore, I believe that this is, for a better word, one Malaysia, uh, one Catholic faith, one holy Catholic, and Catholic means universal. So we have all these flavors added into this archdiocese, and it can only enrich us, learning from other cultures, enriching our own, uh, opening our churches to all these different migrants today, and different visitors, uh, and this is what being Catholic is all about. Making everyone feel at home, everyone has a home. A Catholic needs to go to any Catholic church in the world, regardless of what language they speak, and they feel at home with the liturgy. They know what's going to happen at every part of the Mass, even though the language may be different. Jesus is the same. So. This diversity of our faith is, is, is a sign of our unity. Um, this diversity can be hopefully also an example for the whole, for the whole country, for the whole world, um, especially in this Archdiocese that I hope um, we, can, we can lead the way, show the way to, to our national leaders. Of course, it's happening already in Sabah, Sarawak. Uh, it's so natural for different races, different religions to sit together, eat together, live together in the same house. Many families have multi-religious family members. Okay. And I hope it is they, 
influ influencing us here in, in, in Peninsula rather than we exporting division to Sabah and Sarawak. So that's why I, I, I believe that the more interaction we can have with our Sabahans and Sarawakians in, in the Archdiocese, the more exchanges we have at all levels among the bishops, among our priests, uh, helping out each other during the different feasts, festivals, and already the people are here. So many of them are here, um, almost 400,000 of Sabahan Sarawakians are working here in, 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 in the Archdiocese alone, I think. So this interaction, this exchange of, of views, cultures, uh, even ways, different ways of looking at things can help us to, to enlarge our, our horizons and, and basically to understand each other more. And I think we cannot go wrong when we, we are open to, to different ideas and it may even change our own ways of seeing things and may enrich us. So diversity uh, need not be divisive, but diversity can add to our un in can add to our unity in the sense of uh, not the more the merrier, but rather uh, we are able to learn. From, from from different cultures and different viewpoints but always the one Lord always the one faith always the one the one person Jesus Christ that we follow thank you your grace for your time today thank you for thank having, you, having me this morning